Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Paul Elam with the Voice for Men and the Ear for Men YouTube channel. And I am sitting here uh, across the interweb with well-noted author and men's issues specialist, Dr. Warren Farrell. Warren, how are you doing? I'm doing really well, and especially well uh, having time with you that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, we don't get to talk often enough. Um, and usually when we do, we have to combine it to business as today, but uh, we can make business fun and interesting and educational. And we're here to talk about your new book, The Boy Crisis. And I have read the book, I have compiled notes and what have you. And I wanted to say before we begin on this, and I'm aware that my audience doesn't need an introduction to who you are. And my audience does not need an introduction to men's issues. What I think is remarkable and special about this book, however, is that it begins to give us a view of men's issues through the lives of boys. And that is a critical subject that is not talked about enough. And it is unfortunately subject to the same time of type of pressure to be silenced as, as men's issues. Uh, but we're going to forge ahead with that. And to start with, the boy crisis starts out in part one by giving us an overview of the different areas of boys' lives that are now problematic. And if you'll pardon me for using that word, but mm -hmm. uh, areas of their lives that are rich with problems and challenges. And that is uh, their mental lives, physical, economic, and educational. And so what I'd like to start doing, Warren, is taking each one of those things and maybe having you give a brief overview of what some of those problems are so that we can have a groundwork that we're going to work from from the rest of this two-part interview. Yes. Um, and let's start with boys' mental health, uh, uh, one that's near and dear to my heart. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's going on with boys' mental health in this culture? Yes. W one way of, of just looking at that is when boys and girls are nine years of age, um, they rarely commit suicide and their suicide rate is equal. Uh, but when they get to be 10 to 14, boys, our son's suicide rate is double that of girls. Between the age of 15 and 19, it is quadruple that of girls. And between the ages of 20 and 25, it goes up to almost six times that of girls. So, and, and the boys' suicide rate all over the world, and, and the Boy Crisis book really looks at a worldwide picture of what's happening to boys. Uh, in India, for example, the suicide rate for boys is going up six times as quickly as it is for, for girls. And so um, what I began to see is that the mental health problems of boys, the propensity to depression, the propensity, propensity to suicide, the propensity to um, doing things that, makes them, that make them so angry that they become the school shooters. Uh, these, are the, um, these are things that are so deep in the culture and that when boys hurt mentally, boys who hurt, hurt us. And so uh, we have not had a history as a world of being that interested in keeping boys from being disposable. That is, we have a history of training our sons to be disposable in war, training our sons to be willing to be disposable in the workplace and making them heroes if they are disposable. So, but now, now we're at a different era, an era where the availability of guns can magnify the mental health problems of boys. And that magnification through assault rifles and, and uh, magazines with multiple abil ability to shoot multiple people in a very short period of time is forcing us to look at what's happening with boys because for the first time in history, it's been hurting us. Uh, you said that when we hurt boys, that they can end up hurting us. Yes. Uh, I just caught that in what you said. Can you explain that a, a little bit more? Are you saying that things like some of the violence from boys and perhaps even some of the mass shootings are in their nature retaliatory? Yes. Are they lashing back? And if so, against what? Yes, here's the cycle. Uh, when I started doing the research for the boys' crisis, it was it was like I started looking around at other countries. Eventually, I discovered that in all 63 of the largest developed countries, um, boys are, were having such significant problems. They were falling behind girls in reading and writing, which are the two biggest predictors of success, and every other academic subject as well. 
as well as in their mental health, their, their psychological health. By mental health and psychological health, I mean their empathy was lower than it used to be in past generations. Their ability to connect with friends, that when they were moved to different areas by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, sort of out of poor areas into wealthier neighborhoods with better schools, their, the daughters did well, the boys did worse, worse in better neighborhoods. So I'm thinking to myself, what is happening here? What was common to these 63 developed nations was divorce. Divorce led because the, the, the countries, the developed countries had enough grasp on survival that they can loosen their, their restrictions on divorce. And divorce but per se was not the problem. What was the problem was divorce with children led to the children not having fathers involved in their lives a very significant percentage of the time. And so I found that there was this deep divide between children that had fathers significantly involved after divorce versus children that did not have their father's statistic um, deeply involved after divorce. So in equal shared parent families where the parents lived close enough to each other that they could make contact with each other, where there was no bad mouthing, where there was counseling going on, when those four variables um, were sustained, children didn't do so badly. But when those four variables weren't sustained, when the, particularly when the son lost a significant amount of contact with his father, those were the boys that I ended up calling dad deprived boys. Those are the boys that do the school shootings. So we see with uh, Dylan Roof, um, uh, sorry, with uh, yeah, Dylan Roof and with um, Adam Lanza and with Elliot Rogers, all of the lone school shootings came from boys who were fatherless. The worst, plus the worst school shooting, the worst shooting, the worst mass shooting in recent U.S. history, um, that done by Stephen Paddock in Los Angeles, in Las Vegas, sorry, in Las Vegas, that was a boy who was adopted, didn't have his father, then his adopted father died at the age of seven, then for the rest of his um, life, he was uh, right after that age of seven, he began having deep mental health and physical health experiences, but especially mental health problems. Um, he was you know, reported to the FBI and 911 many, many times. Finally, his mother died a year and a half before he committed the shooting. But the, the, the seeds of his mental health problems were reported multiple, multiple times, even when his, uh, when his adopted father had died. So we see as the common denominator among boys with significant mental health problems, a much greater likelihood to not have father involvement. This is the single most important factor that predicts suicide, depression, drugs, opioid addiction, um, addiction to video games as opposed to just exposure to video games and addiction to video porn. Um, so, but it also has, a, it, is, it is a predictor of 70 other problems that children, ha that children have growing up. Most of them also problems that our daughters have as well, but they're more intensely experienced by our, by our sons. I'll give you one example of that. When boys and girls are without significant father involvement by the age of nine, already by the age of nine, boys and girls' telomeres are shorter. The telomeres are the part of your cell that when your cell reproduces, it has to reproduce telomeres every time. The shorter your telomeres are, the shorter your life expectancy is, particularly when you experience telomeres that are short by the age of nine. So the National Academy of Sciences says that is the greatest predictor of your life expectancy. So without father involvement, girls and boys telomeres are 14% shorter on average, but boys compared to girls, boys telomeres are 40% shorter than girls. And that is what I, I, what I found over and over again around the world is the enormous vulnerability of males. And uh, you see this vulnerability not only among human males, but you see it among um, even animals for, and insects. Um, so when buck elks, for example, um, are mating, the, the, the female buck elks only want to mate with the alpha males. So to become the alpha male, the buck elk um, gr grows these enormous antlers. Well, the antlers on the male that, is the, the, that has the biggest antlers, that an those antlers sap the male buck elk 
of 30% of its uh, calcium, nutrients, and minerals. The buck elk on the outside is the strongest male. On the inside, he's the weakest of all the males. And so if that buck elk does not get rid of his antlers immediately after mating, that, and they serve his purpose, he dies because he can't replenish his nutrients before the winter comes. So, and that's a metaphor for masculinity. Yeah, uh, I, I've never heard a stronger metaphor for modern masculinity. Is it, is, is it something that, you know, that, that and, the, and the metaphor, I mean, the, if I were to put this into one sentence is that men's weakness has been their facade of strength. And that, so here this buck elk has the facade of strength and no one sees that he is in fact the weakest of all the buck elks. And that has been the history of masculinity, which unfortunately we're calling in the culture toxic mas masculinity, when in fact it was heroic masculinity. It was the masculinity to which the females were most attracted, to which 85% of the females reproduced. And so it is, you know, the, the dance between men and women is a tango. We can never blame either gender without looking at the other gender's responsibility. The strength of the women's movement is it expanded women's options. The weakness of women's movement is that it demonized males and, um, and undervalued the family. And so we're dealing with that historic cultural change. But I'm sharing all this because this change is deep within our system. It is the, the same behavior that is true among insects, among birds, among the elks, and among humans. And it, we're not giving that history enough credit. Outstanding. Um, and moving on, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to cover in that. I want to add one other thing. Uh, the one shooter you didn't mention in your list of, of shooters was Nicholas Cruz. And he also was fatherless in this situation. Absolutely. So, Nicholas, Nicholas Cruz is what we call double fatherless. Yes. Um, he was adopted. So therefore, and children and boys, especially who are adopted, uh, feel that they don't have, they don't know half of their biological self. Now, this is really important because when you, when a boy looks in the mirror and he sees the, the eyes of his dad, the nose of his dad, the, the way he walks, being like his dad, and then he doesn't know who his dad is, it's like a, a chicken being raised by a duck uh, or a duck being raised by a chicken. You don't know who you are. So if the ducks all go to swim in the water and the chicken is like, wah, 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 um, our adopted daughter, when she heard me, uh, a, a friend of ours say exactly that, said, that's the way I feel. I feel like I'm a duck raised by a chicken. And so when a boy is raised by a chicken, so to speak, and he's a duck, he never gets to know who he is. And, that's, and here are these adoptive parents who are almost always loving and devoted um, can never substitute for that, that biological dad. But when they try, and then the adopted father dies, as Nicholas Cruz's father died at about the age of seven, um, then that is when Nicholas Cruz started manifesting enormous sets of problems uh, that, uh, that were true for most of his life um, until then his mother also died, and then those problems were magnified even more. Guys, the, the name of the book is The Boy Crisis by Dr. Warren Farrell. There is a link below as you are watching so that you can purchase that book. And I wanted to bring that up because in light of the most recent comments from Dr. Farrell, I also wanted to bring out that I just read another book um, called The Primal Wound, and it's about adoption. And I recommend clinicians, people that work with men, people that have uh, worked with any kind of troubled demographic, uh, that if it involves adoption, it's well worth reading that book to understand the tremendous impact that, that losing your original family and being adopted has on the lives of people. But not to dwell on that, let's move on. Can you tell us in a nutshell about economic and educational health for boys and what's going on there? Yes, absolutely. So when the boy, for example, doesn't have the father, Usually what that leads to um, is a lack of postponed gratification, um, a lack of boundary enforcement. So I'll explain what I mean. Uh, when moms and dads, particularly when they're divorced, um, have children, they both do the same thing. They set the boundaries very similarly. Uh, Sweetie, you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. The children test the boundaries the same way. They have a few more peas 
and then say, can I have my ice cream now? And moms, especially divorced moms, tend to feel guilty about the divorce and feel like, it, it, you know, here the child's been through a lot of stress. i am th been through a lot of stress. I'm not going to take a few peas and make a big argument out of it. Okay, so I'll tell you what, sweetie, you can have your ice cream if you have two more peas. And so the boy has, a, or the girl has a couple more peas, and then the mom feels good that the, she's gotten the boy or girl to do a little bit more. But the child learns, ah, whenever mom sets a boundary, I can manipulate a better deal. With the dad, the dad says the same thing. The child tests the boundaries, and the dad is much more likely, on average, to say something like, excuse me, we have a deal here. Um, you, you, you know, I said, you, you know what the deal is, I know what the deal is, and you know that I know what the deal is. And dads often don't even say this with words. They often just say it with their eyes and like, come on, you know what the deal is. And then the child learns, uh, and the child might say in a divorce situation, you know, your daddy, you're so mean. Mom lets me have the peas without having to, uh, the ice cream without having to finish the peas. And the dad will say, well, you can continue whining like that, and then there'll be no ice cream tomorrow night either. Um, and so the, then the boy starts to learn that around dad, I can't manipulate a better deal. And if I whine and complain, I'm only going to get a worse deal. Around mom, I can manipulate a better deal. So our discussions with, with our interviews with mom um, to help us understand that moms feel overwhelmed and coerced and that the children don't have any discipline. Um, and so, um, and they also have a number, number of other characteristics like depression that I'll get to in a second. So that with the, with the father, the child learns that I have no option but to focus on what I need to focus on to get to what I really want, which is the ice cream. And so what the child learns is attention focus with the father, but it gets a, an attention deficit with the mother. It gets an attention deficit with the mother because it learns it doesn't have to focus on doing what it needs to uh, needs to do to get what it wants. And so children brought up predominantly by dads are only half as likely to have ADHD as children brought up predominantly by moms, even though children brought up predominantly by dads are far more likely to have developmental disabilities when they're extremely young at the age of one. So children, so fathers get the worst group of children in terms of developmental disabilities, but with the father for a number of years, the boundary enforcement leads to the children having the key issue that predicts success. And that key issue is postponed gratification. The child learns it has to postpone the gratification of the ice cream until it finishes the peas. And so therefore you take that into school and you take that into the economy. So in school, the child learns, I, I have to finish my homework before I get read to or bedtime. I can't manipulate a better deal or ice cream. Um, so it ends up learning to finish the homework, get things done in school. It wants to be a basketball player. It learns how to discipline itself to go to practice on time and do the things it takes to be a good basketball player on the high school team. The one with postponed, postponed gratification is much more likely to get the, um, the rewards of being seen as a winner at school the one that without the postponed gratification can complete the project, begins to feel a he, or, he or she is inferior to peers, um, begins to be the quote loser or failure to launch at school, and notices that the teachers don't respect the losers, the, um, that the peers don't wanna be friends with the people who are failures to launch. And then when it comes to girl boy time, girls are not very interested in boys who are reading uh, the boy crisis in the unemployment line of the future, uh, which is the boys that are not um, th that are not doing well. So these boys end up starting to get depressed because they have no friends, they don't have respect. Even their parents are making uh, excuses for them. Uh, they feel uh, parent. They feel their parents are ashamed. They become ashamed of themselves. This depression leads to withdrawal. This withdrawal leads to usually addiction to video games. And then when he becomes 13, 14, 15, he realizes that girls aren't interested in, in going out with him. They're choosing other boys. And so he starts turning to the only source of acceptance by the most attractive girls, which is porn. And so he gets addicted to video porn, but he learns things in video porn that, the, you know, that, that in order to increase and continue his dopamine rushes, he has to take greater and greater risks 
uh, has to see video porn with greater and greater risks being taken. And then when he finally gets to go out with a girl, the girl feels like an object who's just a, who's just trying to be told to act out something that turns him on um, in, in pornography, which leads to his rejection by the real life girl and turns him back into uh, being more addicted to video porn. And so we have that, and then that leads to a deeper and deeper amount of depression and an anger an anger that you know my peers have rejected me, my teachers don't respect me, my parents like my brother or sister better than they like me. And so you can see how that anger with the availability of guns and especially assault rifles can give the boy the fantasy of maybe for a few minutes, I can let wreak havoc on my school system that has rejected me, my teachers that haven't respected me, that no one who understands who I am, I'll get their attention. I'll be, I'll be somebody for a little while. And you especially saw that in, Nic in, um, in Stephen Paddock, whose father was uh, a genius at being able to do evil. And Stephen Paddock was denied of his father's involvement. And I believe was just seeking to say, dad, I can do it in as brilliant a way as you can do it. I can kill and be as destructive as you can be. When male testosterone is not well channeled by the involvement of fathers, male testosterone is the most dangerous, uh, destructive um, energy. When it is well channeled um, by a good adult male, especially a good um, adult dad, um, then it's probably the world's most constructive energy. Okay, great. Um, good explanation. So I take it that what you're saying in many ways, Warren, is that we created a series of euphemisms. We say divorce, we say children of broken homes. What we're really talking about is fatherless children, right? I mean, that's what we really mean by that, is fathers. And, and so let me ask you a tough that's question right. about that. Is that. Exactly, that is exactly right. <laughs> um, are fathers walking out of the home or are they being forced out? I'm afraid, you know, so there's some real clear answers to that. In brief, they're being forced out. Um, I, there's no father's group in the world that I'm aware of that is that is that wants the right to walk out of the home. Um, they, and when we, um, so we have two different dimensions of fathers being excluded from the family. Uh, one is after divorce. And so every father's rights group in the world that I'm aware of is right, is is working hard on the right to fathers to be more involved with the children, not for the right to fathers to be less involved with the children. Um, but they feel like they experience uh, an experience of when there's a divorce, that mothers have the right to children and fathers have to fight for children. Now there's a really major problem here, which is I do a lot of expert witness for, father, uh, for, for fathers to be able to be involved with their children in divorce. But by the time a father gets to me, He's usually already spent about $150,000 trying to fight this battle, which means that I don't get a chance to, uh, uh, that, 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 that men who don't have a lot of money don't even get a chance to go to court and sustain a battle to be involved with their children. Plus, it is, it is disgusting that fathers are having to spend this much money to fight for children, money that can be used for their children's college education, to send their children for to psychologists if they need them, to do whatever they need to do to help their children grow better, for their families to live, live in the neighborhoods they want to live in, to go to the best schools. This is what we're depriving our children of. So that's half the issue, the half the issue being after divorce. We're, we, nobody knows the four things that are necessary to do that to allow for a divorce that leads to children doing much better um, than they would if they didn't have those four things. And those four things are briefly an equal amount of time with both parents. Number two, um, both parents living within about 20 minutes of each other so children don't have to forfeit activities and, um, and friends to go to the other parent's home. Number three, that there's no bad mouthing from mother to father and father to mother. And number four, an, a, um, a significant amount of consistent couples communication counseling, not just for emergencies, but on a consistent, predictable basis, like once every two or three weeks. And when those four ingredients occur, uh, the children have a reasonably good chance in divorce of being able to, um, to do almost as well as they do in the intact family. In other words, more or less the complete exact opposite of what our family courts engender in post-divorce families. Yes, absolutely, absolutely correct. 
the uh, and the other side of that agenda that other the other side of that equation is that 53 percent of american women who are under 30 are having children without being married now per se that doesn't seem like a big thing but there's two groups of those those women women living with men and women who are not living with men at all to begin with the women not living with men at all to begin with almost always have a lack of father involvement but the women living with men tell themselves and the men tell themselves well i'm as good as an, a married family no big problem but 40% of the children who are born to women living with men who are under 30, those fathers are no longer involved with the children after two years. So it's so the, the, there's an enormous risk that one takes when not being married, even if you're living with your partner, to not having the father involved with the children um, uh, within a couple of years after, after that um, occurs. Thank you for that, Lauren. Uh, I want to focus just a moment on something you wrote in the book about the frustrations of divorced fathers in, in trying to cope with life with their children after divorce. And you said, and I'm quoting you here, once I listened, I was struck by how much the dads cared. When they vented their anger about discrimination against them in family court, they sounded legalistic, angry, and bitter. But when I asked them about their children, tears flowed down their cheeks. Their anger was but a mask for vulnerability. The powerlessness they felt as words like visitation and custody made them feel like second-class citizens. And how being able to see their children only every other weekend made them feel that anything they had to contribute would be washed away between visits. Um, I don't think I've heard that, and with all the post-divorce, alienated fathers that I've worked with, that just says it all in a nutshell. And if, uh, forgive me for being presumptuous, but I don't know how much good we ultimately do about a boy crisis without addressing this insanity that goes on uh, in literally ripping fathers away. Is there anything that you wanna add to that statement? Yeah, let's say no, but just that, um, I, well, a few minutes before this call, um, I was on the, uh, on the phone call with um, two producers from um, CBS News Sunday Morning that are considering doing a major feature on the boy crisis. And you know, when, toward the end of the, the pre-interview, they said to me, you know, there's so much in this book. We don't, there's maybe 30 different angles we could take. Um, and I'm really, uh, and it's, it's at least a three hour program. We're going to have to do this for seven to nine minutes. Where do we go? What's your, what's your thought? What's the most important thing? And I said, the most important thing is that, is that we are dealing with men being prevented from entering into the gender roles of raising children in the same way that women in the forties and fifties were prevented from entering into a more flexible gender role of the workplace. We have dealt with the workplace. We have, we have worked to make it more equitable for 50 years. Um, and we haven't done anything significant about getting men to be involved with the children. And so if you want to start somewhere, that is the most important single place to start is the problems that come from our courts not being able to facilitate father involvement Rather that rather rather they charge fathers a hundred or hundred fifty thousand dollars to fight for involvement, therefore limiting father involvement to only the the rich. I want to move on to a little bit more of a bird's eye view of the whole men's and boys issues thing that was brought up, and there were parts of the book, for instance, when you mentioned that men die of 14 of the 15 top leading causes of death more than women. I mean, I'm assuming the 15th is, is breast cancer. Um, no, no, the 15th is Alzheimer's. And oh, is it? Women die of Alzheimer's um, sooner because men die of other things sooner. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> more women live long enough to get Alzheimer's. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay. They don't, they don't die sooner, I'm sorry, of Alzheimer's. They die in higher numbers because they they live long enough to, to get to that right. stage. Right, because heart disease or something else doesn't kill them yes, first. Exactly. Um, 
And, you know, all this, this talk about these issues brought me back to 1993, reading the myth of male power. And you go on to say that uh, you've heard this ad for K jewelers. Every kiss begins with K. The translation is a diamond for a kiss or every kiss begins with K. Um, this is getting into the area. And um, I think probably one of the more sticky, difficult parts of the discussion of how we look at how we socialize boys. Mm -hmm. what lessons we teach them growing up. You know, there's an awful lot of loving, concerned mothers that are good people who thinks that every kiss should begins with K. Mm -hmm. um, how do we come up against this? And again, I'm, I'm folks, this is me saying this, not Warren. Uh, I'm saying this is a socialized very grandiose sense of entitlement that the society puts into women, that it, it creates an undue burden on boys and men, and it creates a lot of resentment, uh, a lot of depression. I think we could go into an hours long discussion. But Warren, part of your whole thing for years now, I've noticed, is that you've tried to reach mothers mm -hmm. about the issues with their sons, feeling like that may be a more friendly door in to talking about men's issues because you can you can tap into the love and concern that mothers have for their sons mm -hmm. with this. But you also still, I mean, no matter how, what avenue you take into this, one of the things we can't avoid is dealing with this level of gynocentrism in, in our culture. How do we do that without alienating uh, women. I mean, I gave up on not trying to alienate them a long time ago, and it wasn't that I wanted to, but I just never could figure out how do you bring up these issues and talk about them with authority and credibility yes. without challenging sacred cows in our culture that people are very, very attached to. Yes, absolutely. Well, one of the things that every mother and father cares about is making sure their son is being able to have his unique self um, recognized and discovered. Mothers are really good at sort of being sensitive to, to their sons and their daughters. And, um, and so one of the things we need to do is to educate both parents that when the boy feels like I need to um, pay for the girl's drinks, I need to pay for her dinner, I need to pay to drive her, uh, that the, the degree to which he believes that is the degree to which he pulls into his life girls who are entitled to be paid for just for their company, which we call a prostitute when it's in a bigger way, but we're afraid to use, even use that word. But what we can do, what every parent can do, is to realize, to, to say to your son, sweetie, you're worth being paid for as much as you pay. And when we bring this into the larger discussion of the Me Too movement, um, the we, we need to say to our daughters, um, it's it's, it's one thing for you to say that boys have the expectation of taking the sexual initiatives and girls, you have the option of taking the sexual initiatives, but sexual initiatives are our primal way of learning how to risk rejection and take risks. And if we're not saying to our daughters, girls, it's important for you to not only pay for boys, but to risk rejection from boys by saying the boy that you want, rather than expecting the boy to take the initiative with you. And then if he does it too quickly, you blame him. If he doesn't do it quickly enough, you don't even see him and you ignore him. We want you, our daughters, to go out there and risk an equal amount of um, sexual rejection from boys by expectation, not by option. When you do that, sometimes you will ask a few times and the boy will really not be interested, and you will have the boy will have felt you overreached, or he'll be very awkward about having to say no to somebody he's not interested in. So you will experience the overreaching that many boys experience when they're trying to get to somebody that they're really attracted to who's not paying attention to them. On the other hand, you'll also experience being ignored if you don't say something. Well, this is what happens when you learn to start a company. All of the entrepreneurs all the entrepreneurs that are our major entrepreneurs started um, the apples started um, 
the you know almost every major company, whether it's Steve Jobs or whether it's um, Bill Gates or so on, they're almost all males. Males who didn't get privileged to rise up through the structure by uh, companies who, and corporations who said, oh, I like you more because you're a male. Males who started from their garage and with nothing and no, and no um, support created their own ladders to build on their own walls. These are all males. They're not females doing this from the beginning. Why is this happening? In part because our we're not training our daughters to take the risks of sexual rejection that leads them to knowing what an entrepreneur goes through. What does an entrepreneur goes through? Go through an entrepreneur goes through being rejected, rejected, and rejected over and over again. Starting uh, taking risks, and then um, you know venture capitalists not doing this for them, and so on, and eventually making it through. That's what we praise our males for doing. But we shouldn't just be praising our males for doing that, uh, because when we only praise our males, the males who are the biggest risk takers will oftentimes with women not know how to take no for an answer, and but they will have had no experience of having to deal with women who have, haven't had to take, haven't learned how to take no for an answer. So we'll, we get both sexes far more compassionate to each other when we, when we learn that the best girls grow up without being tight, entitled to being paid for, <coughs> to being picked up, <coughs> to having um, drinks precede any type of hope of sexuality. And we also empower our girls with, enjoy your sexuality. Sexuality is not just something that is done badly by, by the Harvey Weinsteins of the world. Sexuality is beautiful. In Germany and many European countries, there is much less, fewer hangups about sexuality. So we have to revamp the way we look at sexuality and revamp girls sharing responsibility with boys as opposed to just blaming boys when they do it wrong. That's what, and that's moving our daughters from entitled to be, from, uh, from uh, adolescent feminists to adult feminists. Uh, that is a good bit of a challenge, isn't it, Warren, and considering our culture is sort of full of the legacies of Victorianism. It is a huge challenge. And, you know, and, and that is you know, what, what inspires me to write a book is um, like the boy crisis is to is to say this is a major challenge in our culture. That's what led to the myth of male power saying this is not being seen by people. And I'm not going to necessarily be able to change this. Um, but I at least want to spend my life having some input into whatever I can do to move us in that direction. Um, and sometimes we move in, in leaps and bounds, like we did with Me Too was a leap and bound movement. The um, the the Parkland shooting was a leap and bound movement. We sometimes when we when we get a certain level of consciousness that builds up for a while, we suddenly have a, um, a people um, respond in a way that we didn't see before that. Can we take a, a short diversion here, Warren, and talk sure. for a, just a moment or two about the Me Too movement? Sure. Um, <clears throat> a question about that. You know, obviously, um, the casting couch culture of Hollywood was no secret before Me Too. Um, I wonder if you're concerned at all. I mean, certainly, I think that uh, the idea of rebelling against a system which demands you produce sexually in order for an opportunity. I've got no issue with that, no problem with that at all. I think it's a good thing down the road. But also part of this culture is many, many women using their sex and sexuality in order to get ahead in places like Hollywood. Are you at all concerned that Me Too distorts the reality of, of what the contract is and has been in Hollywood because it wasn't just a bunch of filthy rich producers smoking cigars and saying, I'll give you a part for a blowjob. It was a mutual agreement, oftentimes between aspiring starlets and producers who willingly gave of themselves sexually in order to get ahead. Yeah. Um, and, and my concern, I guess what I'm saying, is that the Me Too movement seems to have painted a picture of Hollywood and the rest of American culture as though it's all a one-way street of sexual coercion coming from men against women, which I think is a very inaccurate portrayal. I very much agree with you. So first of all, um, I see that if the Me Too movement is going to be effective, it will be the first step of about a 10-step process. 
Um, so I'll give you a, a sense of this. So do I applaud women speaking up, saying what they feel, saying what is hurting them, saying what's bothering them. We need to know that. Um, and so, but I also um, applaud our, our sons speaking up. Right now we have a monologue, not a dialogue. Um, our sons need to talk about their fears of rejection, what's happening uh, with them, their, their side of the gender coin and sexuality. And so, um, and, and that has not happened for the most part. We used to have a battle of the sexes and you know, every TV show would you know, sort of toy with the battle and would become a comedy. Now we don't have a battle of the sexes. We have a war in which only one side has shown up and men have put their heads in the sand and hoped the bullets would miss. That's extremely damaging because men have been trained to repress their feelings. This only tells every man and boy to repress your feelings even more. Because if you talk about in a school today where, where white male privilege is being held up as being the issue, and you say, excuse me, but you know when I call a girl, I'm really afraid of rejection, and it doesn't feel like privilege to be expected to call the girl, and it doesn't feel like privilege to be expected to pay for her, and it doesn't feel like privilege to be expected to not think I'm worthy of her unless I buy dinner and drinks for her, and it doesn't feel like privilege for me to be the one to be expected to pick her up. Um, that's, can, I, can I talk about that? And the whole atmosphere of the classroom is, excuse me, you have white male privilege or you even have black, uh, you have privilege as a male because you're black. Uh, this, is, this is not an atmosphere that allows a dialogue to occur. And that's a sin. That's what part one. Part two of, the, of what's happened so far is exactly what you're talking about. So who is being hurt by the, uh, the girls who feel like they have to respond to Harvey Weinstein by being sexual with him. Yes, the girls and women who are being pressured, they are being hurt. But also every woman who gives into that pressure is, is hurting every other girl and woman who will not give into that pressure, who realizes that she could have had a job uh, and access if it wasn't for um, the fact that she's wanting to not trade her sexuality. Uh, for access. We have to remember that almost every sales convention, the single biggest thing that they deal with is how to get access to the executives. Women have a pathway to access to the executives that is a type of privilege that, the 90, that almost any heterosexual man doesn't have. I have a friend named Tom Bresnahan who was in Hollywood and he was, um, and he was being mentored by Kevin Spacey. Um, and so um, the, and, but he was, but he then, Kevin Spacey came on to him and said, you know, why are you, uh, wanted him to be responsive um, to him. And he was not gay in his orientation and he refused to be responsive to Kevin Spacey. And he knew when he refused to be responsive to Kevin Spacey that he would decrease Kevin Spacey's incentive to make, to be a mentor, that he would lose parts in Hollywood and he did lose parts in Hollywood by not being responsive. Um, and so he had to be, but he didn't complain about it. Men don't speak up about these things. A good percentage of Hollywood producers are gay who are doing to, who are reaching out to boys and young men in the same way that Tom, my friend, uh, was, was being reached out to by Kevin Spacey. And so this is, um, this is the type of non-speaking up by males of their way of experiencing the world. The second thing is that one of the stages of the Me Too movement has to be evolve into saying, you know, girls, women, we expect you to reach out and risk the sexual rejection for the reasons I mentioned before. And another is for boys to speak about how sex roles hurts them. How does a boy feel being raised in a home without a father because his father lost the ability to see him in court. How, how about instead of hashtag me too, that we have hashtag no role model, hashtag no role model. That's the boy's equivalent of hashtag me too. Do I applaud hashtag me too? Yes, but I stop my applause the moment it doesn't go through many more stages because we're, we're dealing with the male female tango. The male-female tango, if you change any part of it, 
every part of it needs to change. Am I in favor of every part of it changing? Yes, but, I, but, but we have a history of millions of years of evolution for, that's not going to make it easy. Fortunately, we do have brains and we do have the ability as, as um, animals and human beings to adapt. That is also part of our biology. I would suggest that a good part of our biolog biological heritage, or what I call our genetic heritage, is destructive. Part of it is very constructive. We need to take the best of both worlds and adapt accordingly. Excellent. Thank you for that. And I didn't want to stay on that subject too long, but it is current and I think relevant to this discussion in ways. I want to move on now to solutions, to hopeful solutions, because your book is full of those too and suggestions for what we can do. And to start with that, I want to ask you what you mean by the path to purpose generation gap. Yes. Um, in my father's day and, and our grandfather's day, I'm 74 and my father was born in 1910. And so by the time he was 45, he had been through World War I, World War II, and a depression. Um, so a few things were really clear to him. One is, you know, as a boy, uh, the boys who were most um, valued were the ones who were the heroes, the ones that were preparing themselves for disposability um, in war, uh, either World War I or World War II, the, and clearly the ones who earned money so that they could survive a depression and had a stable job. And so this, so the, the, the bad news was that our boys were trained to be disposable, uh, either in war or in work. My father didn't, nobody said to my father, now choose, well, my father, when I started to become an author, my father was very much opposed to it. He, um, one day we, he came out to visit me at my home and it was clear that I had already written one book and was going to, on to write a second and a third. He, um, and he, he, for three days we talked, but completely about my dad. And finally I confronted my dad and said, dad, for three days we've only talked about you. Why are you, why have you asked me not a single question about myself? And he said, because, I, and then he paused. After a long pause, he said, because I feel like the work that you're doing is ruining the lives of millions of people. And I said, well, first of all, thank you for thinking I have effects on millions of people. <laughs> but, <laughs> Man, that's rough coming from your dad. Isn't it? Yes, it is rough coming from my dad. <laughs> but I said, tell me why. And he said, because when you help people rethink what they're doing with their lives, you, you make them weak to do what a man has to do. What a man has to do is to not think about what he wants to do, but to think about what he has to do. You're getting people to think about what they want to do. And he says that undermines the will, the motivation, <coughs> excuse me, <And> to get, <coughs> that undermines the motivation to get people to do what they must do which is to go to war, otherwise we'd, have, we'd be under Nazi rule, or alternatively to, to support their family. And he said, you're writing books. Yes, your first book has done well, Warren, um, but there's no guarantee as an author that your future books will do well. This will supply an unstable, insecure environment for your future family. And I'm afraid to talk to you about that because I love you and I don't want to get into a big argument with you. But you asked the question, Here's the answer. So his path to purpose was very clear. He knew what he had to do. And his path to purpose was from my perspective, having had the privilege of growing up in a working middle-class family where at least I had enough money to be able to think about myself in addition to just thinking about following the rules that my father had to follow. Um, I started to think about what I wanted to do, what fulfilled me, how I could contribute to the world. But the more, the more fulfilled we are, the, the more fulfilled, the more fulfilling the occupation, the less it pays. And so what our father learned to do was to find purposes that paid first. And if they could make a high paying purpose fulfilling, great. But you don't start out with fulfillment first. And so my father was fearful that I was starting out with fulfillment first. Now he does did acknowledge that I got a PhD and so therefore created some economic security uh, for myself to at least be able to teach somewhere. And so that was his- Well, that was until you started speaking out for men. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. I mean, when, when I was speaking out for women, I was making a great deal of money and he saw that. 
and he was proud of that. And so he, that took a little bit of stress off of him. But as I began articulating things that, um, that, that led to empathy for men, I lost my standing ovations. I lost my repeat speaking engagements and I lost almost all of my income. So you know, many millions of dollars I lost by speaking up for men. So I was, it was very clear to me and to my father that speaking up um, uh, empathetically for men, but also being empathetic toward women was not a winning formula. Speaking up empathetically about women and demonizing men was a winning formula. And that's what he worried about. Yeah, and that is sad. Uh, in that context, in that whole point, the path to purpose, uh, this comes up in my work a lot, Warren. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I think it's very fair to say the boy crisis is a men's crisis. There's literally no barrier between the two groups in this, that all the things in your book that you talk about affecting boys early in life, these turn into the issues that men deal with later in mm -hmm. life, one of yes. them being divorce. Yeah. And what I find, I work with a lot of men now who are either divorcing or they're post-divorce and they're dealing with the courts. And once we get past all that superficial stuff, it's important stuff, but it is superficial, the visitation orders, child support and, and stuff like that. You see, I find that the thing in common with most of these men is that they are now struggling for a sense of purpose, yes. that the, their role as the father has been eviscerated. Their role as husband has been eviscerated. Their role as provider is maintained, but only at a distance, only in a sort of extortive uh, kind of a relationship between the court and the ex and the man. And so he's a provider in that sense, and that if he doesn't write a check, he'll go to jail. But there is, for a lot of these men, a crisis in identity and a crisis in purpose post-divorce. And that's where I wanted to, to get you to talk a little bit about the concept, concept of ikigai. The, the Japanese word for purpose and meaning. Can you tell us a little more about that? And for my audience viewers, guys that are struggling with this, of this, what do I do with myself now? What yes. do I do in life now? I know this is a huge question on your parts, and I and I have the feeling that Warren can help provide us some answers on that. And I'd like to talk to, about that some. Absolutely. The path to purpose generation gap is huge because in our father's day, they had a path to purpose that was very secure. Even if they didn't have a father, while they suffered enormously, the entire rest of the culture was making it clear how they could be a man. You could be a man by risking your life in war. You could be a man by earning a lot of money being the sole breadwinner. Now, because women can be sole breadwinners also, being a sole breadwinner is no longer automatically associated with being a man. And going to war is much less needed now than it was in terms of numbers of men needed for that than it used to be. So now that's by itself a path to purpose. That's what I call the purpose void. But, the, but to get purpose, so the, real, the wonderful thing that has happened is this purpose void has an opportunity to be filled by boys discovering who they are, who is their unique self, you know what type of you know what type of tune do I does rings my drum? Um, what fulfills me? But to get to that requires two things. It requires a father being involved in a boy's life most frequently because the father is the boy looking at himself in the future. The father is the boy uh, it allows the boy to sort of explore his possible senses of uniqueness which the mother, by the way, will also do because mothers are very sensitive to their son's special gifts. So that doesn't separate them out from, from the fathers. But what specially separates them out from the fathers is that when a boy says, I have a unique purpose, I wanna, I, I, I'm, a, I'm on my high school basketball team, I can be an NBA player. Well, if he doesn't know how to fulfill, if he doesn't have the post, if he doesn't have the, excuse me, the boundary enforcement that creates the discipline to do to, to participate and go to practices and practice 10 times as hard as anybody else, to take, to take criticism more than anybody else. If he doesn't have that boundary enforcement that creates that discipline, that creates his ability to have postponed gratification because he has that goal of being an NBA player, 
he then eventually loses his ability to have the discipline to be the NBA Bay player. And then the greater his um, the, the greater his aspiration is, the greater his disappointment and shame, not only about feeling his father will be disappointed in him, but also him disappointed and ashamed of himself. And then he begins to fear that other people don't respect him. Um, girls aren't interested. That goes into the depression, potentially suicidal, potentially um, violent and angry cycle that can potentially lead to um, shootings. So the, the difference between the path to purpose generation gap, purpose in the past being clear, purpose in the future being unclear, the boy needs the father guidance to, to help him discover the combination of both his unique self, that is himself as a human being, and himself as a human doing, able to earn the money to make his human being self uh, viable in being able to be a good participant in the family that is respected and desired by females. I want to ask that question even a little more pointedly, mm -hmm. Warren. Um, again, and, and I'm thinking a lot of my audience right here, which tend to be, I'm guessing, I mean, we cover all the demographics are all over the place for my audience, but there is a healthy contingent of post-divorce grown men who don't have a path to reconnecting with their children. It simply does not exist and it will be fought at every turn and they have bankrupt themselves trying to fight it. They have run themselves to ruin. How does the concept of finding your purpose in life help those men when they are not going to get it from their yeah. role as a father or yeah. as a husband? Yes. Well, first of all, there is no perfect answer to that question because that is the, that is the virus, that is the disease, that is the epidemic, that's the black plague that we are being haunted by. And so he can do one of two things. He can either say, I can spend my life fighting for the involvement of fathers so that I know I contributed to the next generation of boys something that was not able to be contributed by me to my son. Or he can look inside of himself and say, what else in the world was I created for? What else in the world is, 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 is good about me? Uh, instead of having my, me define myself as a father, um, can I define myself as a father with a future mate? Or should I just not define myself as a father at all? Or can, be, can I be a Cub Scout leader? Can I be a Boy Scout leader? Can I be a male teacher? Um, can I be somebody who encourages the school system to recruit male teachers? Um, can I be somebody, so look at, um, can I be somebody who, because I don't have to, um, uh, because I can't be a, a father in this direct way, uh, what are the other contributions to the world that I can make? And so, um, and so part of dealing with the world is dealing with its limitations and then making a decision whether you have the personality type to fight those as part of your sense of purpose or whether you have the personality type to choose an alternative sense of purpose that doesn't get defeated by a, a system that is as challenging for men who want to be fathers as it was challenging for women who wanted to be presidents of the United States 50 years ago. Thank you for that. That's, that's what I was looking for and trying to ask, and I'm gonna add one other thing to that. Um, that I often always actually advise men to do in that position, even if it's not, you know, activism on men's issues or on boys' issues, find something that is important to you to do and start doing it. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a harsh order. You know, mm -hmm. if a guy's been dragged through the coals of family court and stripped of all his assets and had his reputation ruined and his kids taken away and his money taken away and the, the, the horrific disruption to life that family courts are inflicting on um, absent parents uh, that they are creating. Yeah. Um, it's really sounds almost callous or indifferent to say, well, what you need to do is you need to find something to do and you need to do it with passion and go after it. And I will maintain that's the best piece of advice you could ever get uh, anywhere. Um, one of the things Warren points out in his book is that people with a sense of purpose live longer than people without a sense of purpose. 
Uh, doesn't the evidence conclude that? Yes, it, it concludes that all over the world. That the sense of purpose um, is really, really crucial. And I, 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 let me just be very a bit more specific about this too. Let me suggest a possible sense of purpose that is enormously needed, aside from being an elementary school teacher. Um, the there's something in all human beings that the Achilles heel of all human beings is our inability to handle personal criticism from a loved one without becoming defensive. That ruins more marriages and more love relationships than any other single phenomenon. Um, after years of presenting men's issues and women's issues, and the, many of you know that the people listening here knows that know that, excuse me, I used to do male beauty contests to help men understand what women go through as a sex object and you then do role reversal dates to help women go through, understand what men go through taking risks of rejection. All of that was really good. And all of that helped people have a greater compassion for the other sex. However, I found that when I really pressed couples, that when they got into an argument where one of them felt criticized, all of that compassion that they had learned about the other sex didn't trump the, the feeling of being criticized. And they would get into an argument and they would escalate and they would not know how to get out of it. And then they were sorry for what they said or did. And, but they had sort of destroyed a connection that they were counting on to deepen their love. And so what I'd like to encourage uh, any man or woman listening here to get involved in, if you want a sense of purpose that will contribute more to the future than any other single thing, get involved in um, helping people to be able to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. This is what I've, you know, about half the things that I do now around the country are exactly this. And so you can you can tap into the warrenferrell.com website and see a little bit about what I do, um, you know, get trained to do this well. It doesn't have to be my method of being able to do a, a workaround to that biological propensity to not be able to handle criticism. Just get involved in knowing how to facilitate communication because that is the single thing that leads to the divorces, that leads to the fatherlessness, that leads to the um, the left not being able to understand the right, uh, Jews not being able to understand Palestinians. That is the core problem that we have more than any other single human problem. Excellent. Warren, I think we've exhausted our time for the day. Um, uh, we said we were going to go 45 minutes to an hour, and an hour uh, evaporated quite quickly. Uh, I've enjoyed this discussion so much, and I do want to continue this perhaps even in three parts. Uh, I have a lot of notes here, a lot of questions, a lot more discussion of problems and solutions to come, and I'd like to invite you to you know, set up with me uh, future talks on the boy crisis. By the way, everybody listening, watching this uh, in the low bar right now, you will find a link to get the boy crisis. Uh, please buy it. And after you buy it and read it, please go in and give Warren a review uh, for the book and help him get this word out here. Uh, these are our boys. We are all of us as men's rights activists initially, um, we are activists for boys in the truest sense. Uh, we and this to me goes all the way back to circumcision, uh, all the way back to that being an incident in men's lives that we need to look at and rethink, as Warren said. Um, and with that, I want to ask you, Warren, if there anything I've asked today or haven't asked today that you wish I would have or would like to say before we close out for this discussion. Well, the wonderful thing that I know that we'll be getting into in parts two and three are solutions that parents can use, that schools can use, um, the solutions like the White House Council on Boys and Men that we need to have at a national level to change the cultural, uh, to, to make a, a, a shift from a cultural shrug to a cultural shift in the, in the culture. And so there's so many levels of this and it's so rewarding for me uh, in a culture where there's a soundbite culture that we're, we're doing a deep dive here and, and creating constructive alternatives for all of us who care so much about uh, not just men and boys, but also girls and women, and also creating boys that our, our daughters can be, feel um, worthy of their love. The one and only Warren Farrell and his new book, The Boy Crisis, available on Amazon right now. 
Uh, Warren, thank you so much for this chat. And I look forward to setting up the next one and going in to more of what you just talked about in a lot more detail than we were able to cover today. It's a really been a pleasure. You're just, uh, I just so appreciate the questions you ask and how wonderfully you listen and then how you come back with follow through that creates even greater depth. Uh, thank you for that, Paul. And thank you. And with that, we'll wish everybody a great day. And as always, we'll see you next time. Thank you.